on today. I just want to wish everyone a good evening um, and welcome you to Crisis the Answer Bible Study. This is where we gather to study God's word and grow together in faith and fellowship. On behalf of our pastor, Apostle Richard R. Taylor, and his lovely wife, Lady Renee Taylor, we extend a warm greeting to those of you who are joining us in person and online. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship with us on tonight. I'm excited on tonight to share with you the profound truths and wisdom that's found in the scriptures. Together, we will gain insight into the word of God and our hearts and our minds will be transformed. I pray that this Bible study will be life-changing and impactful for each and every one of you that are joining us, and I'm confident that you will be blessed by it. Again, I thank you for joining us on tonight, and God bless you abundantly. At this time, we're going to go into our declaration. And if you have your Bibles, you can lift it up and say with us, this is the written word of God. In faith, we believe it. In love, we receive it. In prayer, we demonstrate it. In hope, we live it. God is able. Amen. How many of you know that God is truly able? And so tonight, I'm going to be coming out of Psalms 30 and 5. So if we can go to Psalms 30 and 5, um, I typically come out of the uh, NIV version, um, our New Living Translation. Um, so let's go to Psalms 30 and 5, and it reads, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Amen. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Amen? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And tonight, um, before we go into prayer, I want to use as a subject matter the assurance of joy, the assurance of joy. And so let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to come together to seek your wisdom and guidance. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word today. Help us to remain faithful to you in trials. When we face hard times, help us to lean on your promise that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will be with us, God, even to the end, that you will deliver us from our afflictions, troubles, and fears. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our opening text tonight, I told you, was found in, in Psalms 30 and 5. And it says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. I want to focus on this latter part. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen? Amen. And so in our fast-paced lives that are filled with challenges and setbacks and sometimes overwhelming sorrow, it's easy for us to lose sight of the joy that God has promised us. Many of us are dealing with personal struggles. It's health issues, financial difficulties, relationship problems, or loss of our loved ones. No matter what it may be, in the midst of all of these trials, the Bible promises us that joy is not only, that joy is not only possible, but is guaranteed for those of us who trust in the Lord. Amen. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. This verse reassures us that when we place our trust in God, he will guide us and provide for us. He will give us joy and he will give us the strength that we need. Amen? Amen. And so our main scripture, Psalms 30 and 5, it speaks directly to the heart of this promise. It says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And so to better understand this, we're going to look into the story of Job on tonight. Job was a man who faced immense trials, yet ultimately found restoration and joy. Through Job's journey, we will see how you can persist even after the smoke of trials and tribulations fade away. Job's story is one of the most powerful narratives in the Bible of suffering and faith in the and faith. Job was a man who lost everything, his wealth, his children, 
and even his health. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with Job, I'm going to give you like just a condensed version of what happened, okay? So we see in Job chapter 1 that, you know, we, we have this introduction into Job's prosperity. You know, he's wealthy. He's a righteous man. He's living in the land of use. He has this large family, many servants, extensive livestock, which shows that, you know, he was a wealthy man. Large family, many servants, lots of livestock. And Job is described as blameless and upright. He's described as one who fears God and shuns evil. But then we see in Job 1 and 6 that the enemy comes. And he has a challenge, you know? So he's saying, you know, oh God, Job is only faithful to you because of his prosperity. And so God permits Satan to test Job. He allows him to take away Job's possessions, but he does not allow him to harm Job physically. Okay? And so we, when you jump down to Job 1 and 13, you see here Job's calamities. We see rapidly he loses his livestock. He loses, you know, his servants. He loses all his children to various disasters. But despite the immense loss, Job does not sin and Job does not blame God. Instead, what he does is he worships God and he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so when we jump down to Job chapter 2, we see that, remember I told you, he told him, don't touch his health. But now we see in Job chapter 2 where Satan says, oh, you know, he's again, he's challenging Job's integrity. He's telling God, oh, you know, if you let something happen to his health, if his health is compromised, then Job will indeed curse you. And so God allows Satan to afflict Job with painful sores, but he spares, he, God spares Job's life. At this point, Job's wife comes, and so she's telling him, Job, you just need to curse God and die. But Job, he refuses, and he maintains his faith. Then he has his three friends. They come to call for Job, and then they sit with him in silence for seven days, sharing in his grief. Okay? Then we get down to Job 3. And we see where it says he curses the day of his birth and he expresses his deep anguish. Doesn't curse God. Curses the day of his birth. And then he tells God, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just in so much anguish. At this point, his friends, they engage in a series of conversations with Job. And they tell Job, well, Job, the reason why you're suffering is because you have some hidden sin in your life. Ain't this like people? Why can't it be that God is testing you to take you to another level in him? Why can't it be that God is testing you to build character? Why can't it be that God is testing you to see if you truly trust him? But they say, oh, you must have some hidden sin. And so Job, he defends his innocence and his righteousness. And he tells them, you know, I'm not sinned against God. We jump down to Job 32 and we see a young man, Elihu. He speaks up and he's criticizing both Job and his friends. And he asserts that suffering can be a form of divine discipline and that God's ways are beyond human understanding. We see Job's response, chapter 38. And God speaks to Job out of a whirlwind, challenging him with questions about the creation in the natural world. Here God emphasizes his omnipotence and the limitations of human understanding. We jump down to Job 42, and what do we see? Repentance and restoration. Job humbly responds. He acknowledges God's sovereignty, and he, he acknowledges his own limited understanding. God rebukes Job's friends for their erroneous counsel and instructs them to make a sacrifice. Be careful who you allow in your ear. Job prays for his friends, and God restores Job's fortunes and grants him twice as much as he had before. Amen? So then we see Job lives a long and a prosperous life, seeing his children and grandchildren, the Bible says, to the fourth generation. So that's, that's the Cliff Notes version of the book of Job. Definitely go back and read it for yourself. Okay? And so in spite of Job's calamities, 
despite of tremendous losses, despite of all the suffering by Job, he, his faith in God remained unwavering. In Job 121, Job's response, you heard me say it, was one of worship and acknowledgement of God's sovereignty. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. This is a crucial lesson for us. We ought to recognize that everything we have comes from God and that he has the right to give and to take away, no matter what it may be. There, there are no restrictions. It's God that gives. Amen? And we do this as parents, right? My, my, uh, my son, you know, my eldest son, sometimes he, you know, gets in trouble. And I tell him, go get every electronic that we, that we purchase you, right? And he thinks, oh, you're taking my stuff. No, I'm not taking your stuff. I gave you the stuff. I can take the stuff away. Amen? And so what God gives, he can take. And this is what Job said, you know, the Lord give it and he has the right to take it away. James 1 and 7 reminds us that every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so, you know, it's easy sometimes to trust God when we're being blessed. But Job's faith wasn't just in the blessings. Job's faith was in the character of God. He understood that God is inherently good and just, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what it may look like, God is good and God is just. Amen? And so Job's trust was rooted in the nature of God. It was rooted in God's righteousness. It was rooted in God's love. It was re rooted in God's ultimate control over all things, God's sovereignty. And so, you know, I get it. We're human. And, of course, our natural human reaction to things, you know, when we go through things through trial is to, you know, cry and, you know, to weep and, you know, have sorrow and be in despair. But the question that I have for each and every one of us is how do we cope with the nights of our lives when everything seems dark? Our apostle often tell us what? Don't doubt in the dark what the Lord has shown you in the light. How do you cope? How do you cope when there does not to be seen, when there doesn't seem to be any light around you? Everything just seems dark. And so we know that the psalmist says in our opening scripture, weeping may stay for a night, but here it acknowledges that weeping is a part of life. Just as Job experienced profound grief, we too face seasons of, 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 of grief, right? We face seasons of sorrow. We face seasons of hardship. And these seasons, they can feel long and they can feel unending. And it can seem like there's one thing after another. But I guarantee you that these seasons are not eternal, right? The Bible tells us about seasons. And so Job, he wrestled with pain and with sorrow, and he expressed his anguish openly. Let's look at Job 2 and 10. I want to go there. In Job 2 and 10, Job says, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job's acceptance of both good and bad from God shows a mature faith. Amen? A mature faith. Can you say it? A mature faith. A mature faith recognizes life's complexities. Job didn't hide his pain, but he did bring it to God. This teaches us that weeping and sorrow, they're natural responses to the trials we face. But we can bring the pain. We can bring the sorrow. We can bring the despair to God. Amen? And so we, like Job, must understand that while weeping may stay for the night, it's only temporary. Our grief, our sorrow, though real and painful, will not last forever. So God's promise of joy is on the horizon. Psalms 126 and 5 says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. And so again, 
Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? And so I want to turn to the morning. Let's look at the morning that follows the night, the joy that God promises after our trials. And so the promise in Psalms 30 and 5 is the joy that comes in the morning. After the night of weeping, a new day dawns. And a new day dawns with the promise of rejoicing. For Job, this morning came when God restored his fortunes and blessed him even more than before. And Job 42 and 10 tells us, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes, and gave him twice as much as he had before. God's restoration brought immense joy to Job's life. This teaches us that even after the most intense trials, God's favor and joy can restore us. The morning symbolizes a new beginning. It's a fresh start where God's blessings can flow abundantly. Think about these moments of joy after a season of hardship. Just reflect on how God's blessings brought new life and hope into your situation. Job's story is a testament to the fact that no matter how deep our sorrow, God can and God will bring about a morning of joy. I'm going to say it again. God can and God will bring about a morning of joy. Amen? And so while it's reassuring to know that joy will come, I believe the challenge often lies in holding on to that promise amid ongoing trials. Maintaining our joy requires a deep-rooted faith in God's goodness and his promises. So how do we maintain joy when trials seem overwhelming? Job's story and Psalms 30 and 5 provide insights. Maintaining joy requires a deep-rooted faith in God's goodness and his promises. You heard me say it before. We must trust that God's favor lasts a lifetime. In Psalms 84 and 11, it reads, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Job's walk was blameless. His friends tried to sell, tell him that he was, you know, that he had sinned, but the walk was blameless. And we saw that, the God, that God gave him tr tr double. He didn't withhold any good thing from him. He gave him double. Amen. And Job's faith, you heard me say it before, his faith wasn't just in the blessings he had. His, his faith was in the character of God. He knew that God was just, you heard me say it, God was loving, and that God was sovereign. And so it's this understanding that helped Job trust God even when he didn't understand his circumstances. And when I was writing this, I was reminded of the song, Waymaker. Amen? Because God is a waymaker. And it says in that song that even when I can't see him, what is he doing? He's working. Even when I can't feel him, what is he doing? He's working. But then it doesn't stop there. What does it say? It says he never stops. He never stops working. Amen? So we can't go on what we see. We can't go on what we feel. That's not faith, right? There's another song um, that comes to mind. I'm looking for a miracle, right? What does it talk about there? What do you feel? What do you see? It talks about the invisible. It talks about the intangible. This is faith. Amen. Second, we must have hope in restoration. We got to believe. We got to hope that God is going to restore us. God will restore that which has been lost. And the Bible is full of stories of restoration. Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery, but he rose to power in Egypt. Ruth. 
Ruth lost her husband, but she found a new life with Boaz. You know, we have widows. We, lo we lose husbands and we lose wives. And if it's the will of God, and it's our, you know, it's our heart's desire and it's in line with the will of God, he'll bring us a new, a new spouse. David, he was pursued by Saul. And what happened? He eventually became king. Peter, he denied three, Jesus three times. But ultimately, he was restored and he became a pillar of the early church. And so each of these examples, they remind us that God is in the business of restoration. Amen. Finally, we need community and prayer. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us go there. Here we have some encouragement. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. How can you be spurred if you don't have community? It says not giving up meeting together. How can you be spurred? How can you be encouraged? How can you have find strength amongst those that are of the faith that are praying if you don't meet up together, if you don't assemble yourselves? Assemble yourselves in the church on Sundays. Assemble yourselves for Bible study. Assemble yourselves at meetings outside of church. Call somebody and tell them, come meet you for breakfast. Assemble yourselves. Fellowship with the saints. You can't be fellowshipping only with the world. And think that your mind is going to, you know, be at perfect peace. That you're going to be able to maintain your joy. And I'm not saying don't, don't fellowship with the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you need to fellowship with a community of believers. Your entire friend group can't be just all people that ain't saved now. It says not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It tells us what people are doing. Don't act like we don't know what you're doing. You, you're not meeting. It says but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We're living in the latter days. Today, more than ever, we need to be meeting together. We need to be praying. We need to be encouraging one another. We need to be loving on one another. We need to be forgiving one another. Amen? Amen. And so being part of a community that supports and prays for you can significantly impact your ability to hold on to your joy. You can't just be in the house by yourself, depressed, and thinking that you're going to be able to hold on to your joy. Sleeping all day. In dark rooms all the time. Engage in prayer. Engage with community. These are the things that you need to do if you want to find strength and joy in the midst of your trials. So I challenge you to make it a priority to be actively involved in your community of faith. Make a priority to be actively involved in church. It's not just enough to come in here and sit at the back, sit on the corner. No. Move on up to the front. Get in the middle of your row where you're surrounded by people. Get involved. Be at the door. Greet somebody. Get in the choir. Sing a song. Do something. Don't just come in here and sit. Okay? That's how you build relationships. You come sit in here and you at the back corner all the time. You know, people can barely say hi and bye. Why? Because you come in here late, sit in the back corner, and then when, as soon as the pastor dismiss and you tipping out the door, you in the back corner, you going to beat everybody out to the parking lot to your car. People don't have time to come and get to know you. They don't have time to embrace you. They don't have time to love on you. They don't have time to come, you know, pray and, you know, encourage you. You tip in and tip out quickly. And that's if you come. But I'm going to move on because I, I didn't, didn't mean to stay there. But make it a priority to be actively involved. Reach out for support when you need it. We have the prayer line at the church. We have counselors. Be a source of support for others. Minister Sharon Jones taught a discipleship class. I encourage everyone to take that class. I encourage you to bombard her. She's she probably going to be mad at me after this. But I encourage you to bombard and be like, I heard you taught discipleship. When's the next class? Minister Sherrose Charles, 
overtraining. Bombard them. Be a source of support for others. If you feel like you can't do it, learn how to do it. They have classes where you can learn to be a Christian counselor. Okay? But let us build each other up in love and in faith. Okay? Understanding how to maintain joy during trials leads us to explore the profound depth of joy that goes beyond our immediate circumstances. Let's now focus on a joy that is not dependent on external factors, but is deeply rooted in our relationship with God. Amen? Let's look at the internal. Joy transcends beyond our circumstances. Joy in the Lord is not dependent on our circumstances at all. It ain't dependent upon how much money you got in the bank. It ain't dependent upon if you work. It ain't dependent upon if you, if you broke. It ain't dependent upon if you got a big, it's not at all. We should always have joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You weren't around here walking, wondering why you weak. You ain't got no strength. Maybe check your joy. Maybe, maybe you ain't got no joy. But joy in the Lord is deeper than our circumstances. It's a deeper abiding sense of God's presence and his promises. Job's ultimate joy was not in his restored fortunes. Yeah, the Lord restored to him as he had promised that he would. But Job's joy was never in his fortunes. Not the original fortunes he's had and not when the, the Lord blessed him with double. His ultimate joy was in his deepened understanding of God. Let's look at Job 42 and 5 and see what it says here. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He heard of God, but now he's seen God. He's been in the presence of God. Job's trials led him to a more profound encounter with God. This resulted in a joy that was rooted in divine revelation and not just material blessings. How many of you want a profound, a deep encounter with God? I know I do. And if we want that, sometimes we just, we're going to go through some things. We're going to have to experience some trials. Life ain't going to be perfect. And the Bible never, God never promised us that it would be perfect, right? But he did promise that he would be with us. And so this kind of joy displayed by Job is resilient, and it can withstand all of life's challenges. We must strive to cultivate this joy in our everyday lives. By deepening our relationship with God and finding joy in his presence, we can experience a joy that is unshakable regardless of our external circumstances. Now, when you're facing uncertainty and unfavorable circumstances, here is what I want you to do. I got four things for you. Number one. Anchor in God's nature. In your trials, I want you to focus on God's unchanging character. His favor is for a lifetime. I want you to just focus on that. His favor is for a lifetime. God is unchanging. The Bible says that he does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? In Lamentations 3, through 23, it says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. His love. Focus on God's love. Focus on his compassion. Amen? When you're going through your trials and tribulations, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Focus on his faithfulness. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Amen? Amen? The second thing I want you to do is I want you to, to embrace the night while you await the morning. Right. Amen? Embrace the night while you await the morning. Amen. I want you to acknowledge your sorrows. Just like Job did, nobody's telling you to bottle up your feelings. Acknowledge your sorrows. But I want you to hold on to the promise that joy comes in the morning. 
Psalms 30 and 11 says, you turn my welling into dancing. Amen. Anybody can testify that he has turned your welling into dancing? He has turned my welling into dancing. And it says, and you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. What's a sackcloth? When you're in mourning, they would put on the sackcloth. But it says that you took away that sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. Amen? Amen. So the third thing I want you to do is I want you to seek God's restoration. Remember, Job, what did he do? He repented and sought God's restoration. And so I want you to pray and seek God. But as you pray and seek God, I want you to believe in God's power to restore and to bless abundantly. Jeremiah 30 and 17 says, and we all know it, but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, says the Lord. Amen? I will restore your health and heal your wounds. I don't care how, how sick you may be. My dad gave a testimony about, you know, stage four cancer. Amen? I, it's a lot of people in this, this ministry. They gave, you know, testimonies about, you know, about cancer. I was told by one doctor that, you know, I may never have kids. And if I have kids, I'm going to spend my entire pregnancy on bed rest. I have two boys, seven and two. I didn't spend a day on bed rest. Amen? So I don't care what the doctors tell you. You heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. They practice medicine. But God don't practice anything. He's all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere that you need him to be all at the same time. And he ain't got to split his time. Tonight, my husband, he's with the boys because Benny Luke had a basketball game. So I'm here, he there. Not what he wanted to do, but it needed to be done. But God, he everywhere. He's here with us tonight. He's, he's there with my son at his baseball practice, covering him as he practices, ensuring that he doesn't get hurt. He's, he's with the people that are at home tonight that are receiving the, world, the word, okay? And then the fourth thing I want you to do is I want you to cultivate joy. <laughs> you got to cultivate it, right? You got to engage in practices that foster joy. Worship. You got to worship God. You come in here on Sunday mornings, you feel like, you know, you got a lot on you. I challenge you, just worship God. Amen. Just worship him. Begin to thank him. The Bible tells us that praise will confuse the enemy. He gets confused. Start clapping your hands. Start stomping your feet. It confuses the enemy. Worship. Pray. Seek community. And also reflect on God's promises. What are the promises of God? They're found in the word of God. Read the Bible. Reflect on his promises. This is how you cultivate joy. Amen. Philippians 4 and 4. Let's get it. We have an encouragement here. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Right? Amen. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Amen. No matter what it looks like, rejoice. No matter what it feels like, rejoice. No matter what it sounds like, rejoice. As we reflect on Job's journey and the promise of Psalm 30 and 5, let us recall the lessons of Job and remember we have the assurance of joy. Despite the trials and the tribulations we face, the joy of the Lord is available to us. It is a joy that persists beyond circumstances. It's a joy that's rooted in God's eternal favor and promises. Let us each embrace this joy. Let it be our strength. No matter what we face, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Amen? Amen. So tonight, before we close in prayer, I want to extend several invitations. There may be somebody that's here in our presence or somebody that's watching on social media. You may not know the Lord. I want to extend an invitation to Christ to you. Amen? Jesus said in uh, James, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
So if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, I invite you to repeat this prayer after me. Wherever you are, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be in the church. I don't care where you are. You can be at work in your car. I don't care where you are. You could be watching from, you know, one of the most unseemly places. But what I want you to say is, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and to come into my life. I want to trust you and I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. If you prayed this prayer on tonight, then you are saved. You ought to tell somebody. If you're at your house by yourself, go knock on the next table's No, Text somebody on the phone. Say it on, in the chat on uh, social media, Facebook chat, YouTube chat. Tell somebody, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Amen? Amen. The second invitation, because I told you I had a couple of invitations, is if you're looking for a church home, you don't have a church home, I want you to consider joining our congregation. We're a family of believers here at New Day, and we're committed to growing in faith. We're committed to supporting one another. You heard me talk about community. We have that community here at New Day. We'll love on you. We'll pray with you. We'll walk with you. Join us. You can uh, call the church if you want to, or you can come by the church on Sunday morning. We're here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for prayer. Service starts at 11 a.m. But I invite you to join us. And so at this time, I have nothing further. We're going to uh, go ahead and close out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the assurance of joy that you promised in us. In the midst of our trials and tribulations, help us to hold fast to your promises. Help us to trust in your unchanging character. Strengthen our faith, Lord. Guide us through the night. Help us to embrace the joy that comes in the morning. Restore our hearts. Fill us with unshakable joy, regardless of our circumstances, Lord. Help. <laughs> Lord, I pray that we find comfort in your presence and support in our community of faith. It's these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you for joining us. You have a wonderful evening.